Welcome everybody to this next talk, Inside Android Safety Net Attestation, Attack and Defense. First of all, I would like to see a show of hands. Who among you has already developed an Android app? That's almost everybody, I would say, something between 90 and 98 percent of you. And who of you has already used the Safety Net Attestation API? Please, another show of hands. That feels more like five or six. And who of you has already heard about this API before coming here today? That's more perfect. That's why you are all here, I guess. Um, so gear up for a very informative talk by Colin Mulliner, an expert in the field of security research. And he's also the co-author of the Android Hackers Handbook. I'm very excited for his talk. Please give him a warm round of applause. right in. This was basically, yeah, just some, um, I, I, I did a bunch of like mobile security and development some years ago, wrote a bunch of uh, guides and helped, helped on this book, but let's get right to the talk. So what are the goals for this talk? The, the main goal for this talk is, of course, understanding what Android's safety net and especially the attestation API is, and actually how to really implement and deploy it. As you will see throughout the talk, it's not like that straightforward, unfortunately. And then we're just going to look at the, the attestation API, uh, really what can it do for you and what can't it do for you. And I guess with most, like with most security um, systems or, or features, it's very interesting. The, the part what it can do is the most interesting part. And then we're going to look at some attacks and bypasses um, from other people and some of my own work. And the, the second main goal of this talk is like basically document this API because Google's documentation is not very good, and that's like how I thought like, hey, let's let's talk a little bit about this. So of course, this entire entire system and this entire talk is about app security. And back in the day, uh, apps did not, a lot of apps did not communicate, but these days, if your app doesn't communicate, like who cares? And mostly, it communicates with like an app-specific backend. And if the app and like the backend and everything works, the user is happy, everybody's happy. And um, if it doesn't work, everybody's unhappy, and the company will not make any money, and likely will like discontinue their service. So <laughs> mobile app security um, is really really interesting because these days app, an app or like a mobile app is really just the gateway to like the backend service. Um, and these days, there's a lot of like online services which are basically um, mobile only, or at least mobile first. If you think about something like Snapchat, they don't even have like a, a website or anything. And app security is also about um, basically controlling data. So who uh, like displaying data, managing data by the app, and making sure somebody like is not allowed to copy out data that is like managed by the app. And altogether, basically, mobile app security is really about protecting like your service, your revenue, your brand, and hopefully, hope, uh, really, hopefully, your customer or like the consumer. So, if you look at ad hacks in general, what are we looking actually at? There's the main part is like OS modification. Basically, on Android, we'd say like routing, and routing is basically just like to break the assumptions of the security model. Um, because if you root like your phone, you suddenly are able to like basically take content from apps that didn't want their content to be taken in the first place. And you can do this by just like reading data or like taking screenshots or like instrumenting the app and pulling data out of it. And of course, you can also just modify the app directly and then you can just like change whatever the app is doing or like the, what the app is enforcing. And of course, there's also network traffic, um, but in this talk, I'm not going to like look at network traffic at all. So if you look at routing, um, what is routing actually? It's basically, it's uh, regaining full control over your device because these days, any kind of phone or tablet, um, basically, you don't have root anymore. Like, you don't have full access to everything, like on your computer. And with routing, uh, you gain like the success again. You gain access to resources. You can read and write any file and modify parts of the S or like the software framework. And all of this routing capabilities really highly depend on Android versions. And really newer Android versions um, 
uh, much, much more hardened due to, for example, um, as the Linux policies, um, but I'm not going to jump into that part. So if you look at app security in the old days, what, what did you have? Um, there were like basic routing checks, so apps would implement something like, hey, is the system, does system explain as you exist? If that, so they was just checking, hey, did somebody root the file and reinstall as you? And if that was true, they would just say like, ah, oh, your device is likely rooted, this app is not going to work. And the same with apps, they would just like check if like a specific package is present, or they would check if like expose is installed, and maybe would, would try to detect emulators by just seeing um, what get device ID returns. And if it returns zero, it's often like an emulator. So that's like really the old days. And the old days, um, it was for the developers really, really, really easy to implement because they just they knew they they, was, uh, um, they can just like check for certain files or certain packages, and it's like really easy to implement. You don't have to be like a genius. You just have to, like check for this file, and then you can very easily or they, yeah de deploy deploy those kind of checks. But of course, for the attacker, it's uh, the easy as well because they also understand how this works, so they can just like rename some files or move files around, um, and then they can, again, abuse those applications. So modern uh, mobile app security really works by collecting data. Basically, you have some, some piece of code that just like collects data uh, and just sends it to the back end, and your back end will make the decision if a specific, um, secure, like a, a specific thing happened. For example, if your device is rooted, and the idea behind it is that the attacker cannot just like patch out your app, like patch out checks on your app, because um, yeah, imagine if you just like do a file access check to like a system bin as you, you can just like remove that, and then the app will just work. But if you collect uh, really a lot of data on the device, you really don't know what is used for what, and you basically have to fake all the data. And if you collect uh, really a lot of data, um, you can't really do that. Um, that's basically what all modern um, apps that have like a high demand or higher demand for security do these days. Um, and also that is what safety and attestation will do for you. So um, just to go a little bit back to like Android. So in the early days, um, Android was very, I would say, very open. But these days, um, a lot of openness like went away. They have like secure boot now. And um, which is basically just a trust anchor. And basically, they just like are able to like t uh, tell if you like unlocked your bootloader and things like that. And of course, there's way more as a Linux restrictions, so they have like much uh, stricter sandboxes. And then Google added this platform security service called SafetyNet. And SafetyNet is really just a brand name for like security services on Android. They have a bunch of different. Um, Services like from verified apps to ch uh, and then to like check for PHAs, which is Google's nicer term for like malware. And then you have attestation, and you have like a capture service. And this and uh, safety net in general is designed to like run on any Android device that has Google Play. Um, so it's like part of Google Play services. Um, and the nice part, it's like independent from the manufacturer. So this exists on any on any Android device, um, not only on like the Google devices. And with attestation, you can do remote um, device and app attestation. Um, so, and of course, Google also may heavily uses um, their own APIs. Um, for example, if you ever used Android Pay and um, saw this um, this nice pop-up, that meant um, SafetyNet actually failed to um, validate your or attest your device or like your or like um, I guess the Android Pay app. And they said, like, oh, yeah, you, you modified something. Um, and one of the intentions, I think, behind the attestation part was um, they can't really control security of like, other manufacturers' devices, but they wanted to support Apple Pay on them. So what, do they, what did they do? They basically um, um, found a way to like, measure if like, your device uh, or the device Apple uh, Android Pay uh, is running on it was modified. And the nice part is um, they can really change um, safety net, or, like the attestation part on the fly. So you don't have to like wait for like a system uh, software update. It like basically they push co can push code to the device at any point to like check for um, yeah modi modifications. 
and for, with that they can like really fast f uh, react to say new routes or something without like having any like software updates being delivered to the devices. Um, so, um, so what what is actually the attestation part? Um, it's really the attestation of the device and the specific app that called the API. That's basically all of the things people use to implement themselves. And as I said, it's like part of the Google Play services. Um, and basically, you just call an API and validate that your app and device is like the, 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 the device of the, the user was not modified. Unfortunately, the, the documentation, as I like said in the introduction, is not, not super um, detailed, and they leave a lot of things to like your interpretation, or just like you have to basically use it to like find out how this really works. Um, so over time, it got much better. But when I started looking at it, which is by I guess yeah, one and a half, two years ago, um, some of the documentation was like really bad, and they add new features without really documenting them. Um, they have like a private mailing list um, where they announce some stuff, but yeah. Um, yeah, this is probably, I guess, the only piece of code actually I'm going to show. It's basically just like how you call it. So, um, SafetyNet is part of the Google API client, and you basically just say, I want a connection to the uh, SafetyNet API, and then you just like call it. So, how does it, how does it actually work? So, here, um, in the middle, the box in the middle is basically that's the software that's running on the phone. You have the backend, the Google Play backend, and your application's um, backend. So if your if your app doesn't have its own backend, you really can't use SafetyNet at all. Um, and you will see in a second why that is. So basically, what happens if your your app like talks to your backend for maybe maybe wants to log in or do like some very specific operation, and then your backend will say, hey, dear application, um, I need you, uh, I request you to like attest yourself. So the backend will basically send a request to its app. The app will then like call the safety net attestation API. And in this, in this step, you actually see um, the, um, the, uh, uh, the attestation code on the device will inspect the de device itself. So like the operating system, was it rooted? And then it will also, also inspect the actual application. Uh, some minor detail, like in the, in the call, there should be a, a nonce to like uh, prevent replays. It's just like for documentation. So that's basically, you. instead of having you implement everything um, yourself, you can just call this API, and you will have uh, all, all the work done by Google engineers to do your um, your security your security configurations or conf security attestations. Um, so what happens after the after uh, attestation has checked your app and the device? It will send the data back to Google. Google will actually analyze it and then um, will determine the state of your device and your app, and actually forward the response to your app. Um, and in order to to make sure the app, because if you modify the app in this case. And if it would not be signed, um, you could just like tamper with like this attestation response. So this is signed. So in the back end, you should um, validate that signature and then validate the attestation, and then you actually know what you're dealing with. That's basically what you get back. It's really, really, really simple. Just some blobs of Base64 encoding. So Google has a signature validation API, which is basically just for uh, development purposes. Um, but yeah, that, that part is actually pretty well documented. I guess um, they do that a lot, like SSL cert validation. But let's go look at the attestation data. So the attestation data, that's basically the main blob you get back. Everything else is just like a chain and the signature. So you see um, the CTS profile match, and that refers to, that's basically the, the, core, the, core, uh, the core device integrity measure. And CTS um, refers to the Google um, uh, compatibil compatibil compatibility test suite. So basically, whenever you build an Android device, you have to run this like test suite and give Google the results. And basically, what this, uh, what this um, API does, it basically collects data from your phone, and then it compares it to um, the data the manufacturer provided. And by this, they can determine if you modified contents of like your system file system. 
And then you see like which, which APK called the API, and then you get a digest um, of the APK itself. You get your non-spec, and then you also have like timestamps. And the basic integrity is an indicator about routing. So this is um, this nice table was actually only, I guess, probably added to like their documentation maybe like seven months ago. And before it was like, yeah, there's a true, a true and false field. And yeah. So basically here you can see um, CTS will only be true if your device is like genuine and passed like the, the, CT, the CTS data con corresponds to the data that was collected. Um, if, as soon as you unlock your bootloader, that goes to false, and, but basic integrity will still be there. So if you just unlock your bootloader, um, but didn't modify actually the content of your file systems, your basic integrity is true. Um, and that's basically those two different uh, um, indicators will basically help you to um, understand the state of the device. And with this nice table, you can do some, um, yeah, basically implement like your checks. So I, I wrote this like small demo. Like I actually implemented that for like a, a bigger company, but I also yeah uh, built this like small demo up, which I'm going to show you at the end. And you see some yeah. It will basically just like run this attestation, and it will tell you like if your device is rooted and what the app integrity is. And you see the blob of data um, below, and you see like everything is um, it passes all of the checks. And we're going to have some, some more fun with this later. Yeah, the big, the big issue with SafetyNet and the attestation API is like error, mess or like error states. There's a ton of different errors. And if you don't know what you're dealing with, you can basically very easily bypass the entire system. Um, um, yeah, if, if you as an implementer don't, don't are, aren't aware of like error messages. So for example, this is one of the nice um, inter, uh, 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 basic errors. Basically, if for some reason the API ran, uh, or the, the API call actually worked, but somehow the, in, the, the code inside the API like, just like, encountered some random error, you will get this. And they basically say, oh, yeah, we just like, have this like, random error message. And you, you're then like, yeah, you're going to find out like, what, how this actually looks like. Because this is not really documented. And this error basically just means just call the API again and try again. Most of the time, it will just like go. Um, yeah, this is one of the more interesting errors. Um, this basically says we can't really determine which API called, uh, which APK called the API. Also, they kind of think the uh, device is generally untrusted. So they just like removed a bunch of um, fields from um, this JSON response, which is also very confusing if you like implement this the first time because you suddenly get like broken data blobs back. And of course, of, again, of course, this was like not not really documented. So now you know, like basically, uh, we have we have this API and like there maybe the JSON field looks strange. Um, so basically, now you can go and just like implement um, your app and talk, uh, have the interaction between your app and your backend, and your app running the attestation. Um, but unfortunately, it's like still not that simple. So also, all of the API calls can kind of fail, and they actually will fail in the wild. Like er like all of the every every API you call will actually fail at some point if you. Uh, Depending on like your user group, if you have, if you're playing at home with well, one of your devices, you will never see any of those errors. Um, but if you like say run, <clears throat> if your app runs on like hundred thousand or millions of devices, you will see every every error eventually. Um, and you have um, things like oh, like Google Play services doesn't support safety net yet. So what should you do? And one part is you can like just update play, or force a user to update their play services, um, or um, and then there is like just like general error connection errors, um, and in those cases you just like really have to retry. Um, if you forget to uh, to like handle one of those errors, that either means um, some some client will basically not work on your network, or some client will be allowed to like connect to your service even if it was tampered with. Um, and like the, the lower three cases, that's like really something you should actually 
um, be able to, to see during development because if your nonce is too short, it will actually just like fail even, yeah, it will just like directly fail. Um, yeah, some, some more examples. So I just like install, I just like uninstalled the all play services updates on, on this like Nexus 7, which is like an Android 4, which also doesn't have secure boot. And then if you like just start the application, you'll just like nothing will work, like because you really need to upload those play services. Um, so a lot of a lot of the API failure things are basically temporary failures. So you basically have to start with retrying everything. Generic errors, networking errors. And in general, you should be like a good citizen and like basically do an exponential back off after each um, failed try. Also, you can look into um, this JSON field or this JSON blob on the device itself and then determine if you do, if you want to do a retry, then you don't have to do a full um, round trip to your backend. But basically what you really need to do is report any of the failures to your backend um, and really plan what you're going to do if like some device keeps just like throwing errors because that's in the worst case a customer of, or a user of your app that can never use the app because if they have some random error. Um, so you have, you have to be like really, we have to really think hard about what you're going to do. Unfortunately, this of course is an app specific behavior because in some cases it's like, ah, oh, maybe you're just going like, to let, let the person use it like once or twice, but maybe you say like, we never want anybody who fails this um, to ever use our service. And this is like really more app specific um, um, decisions. So let's look at, um, yeah, so the first and the, the, the main function, or one of the, the two functionalities, like the OS uh, and device integrity check, and that's basically just like those two fields which give you like true or false. Um, but app integrity works a little bit different because they actually, Google can actually re can't really tell you if your app, integ if app integrity is, is there. And you have those two fields, the APK digest and the APK cert digest. And the cert digest is really like the digest of your, the key you, you assigned your APK with. Um, so in the easy mode, so if you resign an application, the, the cert digest will be of course different. So if somebody try, just like uses APK tool on your app, modifies the app, reinstalls it, the APK the cert digest will be different. So the most easy check to check for app integrity is basically just like compare the APK cert digest. And you kind of say if you have five different apps and you can, and of most likely they will all be um, um, signed with the same cert. You basically only have to like hard code this like cert digest into your backend once and you can just like always compare that. Um, yeah, that's like really, if you like done this, like it's basically a very, a very, very simple comparison. Um, but with that, you can know if like your app, your, your app is like uh, not tampered with. But you can also go uh, into advanced mode and basically also compare the APK digest. Um, with that, of course, um, a little bit different or a little bit more difficult because um, that means for every single APK you ever released um, to the a uh, App Store, um, you basically have to record the, the digest of the file because if you didn't do that, you will just like reject people and say like, hey, we don't recognize this app. Um, yeah, you probably modified your app, but in reality, maybe you just like forgot to like collect the data. So you have to have like very tight control over your release process, but you can do cool stuff like revoke specific APK versions at this like very early part in the communication with your server by just like deleting that specific a digest from your database and then safety net will basically block this APK for you. Um, yeah. So, yeah, basically, so to do the implementation and deployment, um, yeah, on the client side, you really have to check for error conditions, retry, and report failure codes. In the back end, you really have to make sure to validate the signature and the attestation data, um, check really all fields, timestamps, nonce, and really make a decision about uh, failures and what you want to do. And especially like things like, do we want to force um, users to update their play services? And maybe have something like a white listing mechanism 
um, where you can whitelist maybe specific kind of devices because you will run into problems and you probably don't want to um, prevent a, like, a specific user group from not using, being able to use your service. So until yeah, so that's basically the the part about what is at a safety net attestation, how does it work, what what you should look out for when um, they're trying to implement and deploy it. But of course, um, as I guess anybody who is like interested in security, and if you like um, implement or um, a new security system, you really want to um, know if you can actually trust that system or if it just like does nothing. Um, so when I, when I first looked at it, I was like, let's see how good this actually is, and can we do like bypasses? And also, what are the limitations? Um, obvious limitations, I guess, um, were um, Android, uh, different Android versions. Because on Android 4 and 5, you really don't have like, this um, secure boot state. Like um, Applications cannot determine this, uh, this, uh, the boot state. So anything that would be based on um, unlocking the, your bootloader uh, would, would basically work because if you can't detect that the bootloader was unlocked, um, you can't block un uh, unlocked uh, bootloader. Uh, yeah. And on Android 6, um, yeah, of course you can detect um, the boot state and then you can actually rely on everything that is um, based on yeah, the secure boot mode. Um, but this, of course, already shows you that um, all devices um, kind of um, yeah are hard, very much harder to like judge um, in terms of the attestation system because of certain limitations of the actual OS. So in your in your security policy in your backend, you basically have to to know that hey, if if something like Android fi four or five devices, m we might not be able to see certain things if we just use safety net. And you have like other things with Android 4, so you don't have DM Verity. That means you can just remount and write uh, or change files in the, on the system partition. So like you can do fun things like um, um, change or rename or move like uh, system xbinsu to some other directory. And then if you just like, run your safety net enabled application, you will totally bypass, um, or you will actually not, you will not bypass, but you will just pass the attestation because the system will say, yeah, fine, nothing was modified. And, um, and then after using that app, you can basically restore SU to like by copying it back. Um, you could also, and that also is like another, another basically indicator what you should do. If you only like basically run safety net on, on app startup, you can do things like that. But say if you use it more often, like at random intervals, just the backend, the backend server is like at random intervals, just like says, "Hey, can you rerun this attestation for me?" Those things have become a little bit harder. Of course, none of this like is documented at all. So, this my this like small demo application again. It's like this was like a Nexus 5 X with Android 6, and I just unlocked the bootloader, and then if you like run the attestation. We'll see something like this, like CQ boot mode. That actually doesn't come from the attestation API. I just like read that from the system properties, but it basically detects, yeah, unlocked bootloader, and um, so it will change. Uh, yeah, where is it? Yeah, the CTS profile in the middle to false, and it would also give you like an advice, which like, hey, you should relock your bootloader. And this advice field is also something that just like added, I think earlier this year, just under. Just like they just added it, and you were like, you were looking. I was looking at the, this JSON file, and I was like, hey, there's a new field, and it's like undocumented. Nice. So, um, Sue Hyde and, and Magisk. So, um, um, obviously, if a system like that exists, people will try to bypass it. And one of the first bypasses for this, for this was Su Hyde. Basically, it's. Um, you can call it um, a rootkit because it's um, really just hiding, uh, uh, trying to hide um, that the basically that you rooted your device from safety net. And um, that was the SU hide was very simple, and you, Google very easily um, actually detected it. And you could actually read in forums like the people would post, "Oh, I can't like use SU hide anymore." They did now detect that, and then two weeks later, there was like, or maybe even like two days later, there was like an update, and it worked again, and then it was like 
detected again. And that's really where this like short um, um, iteration cycle due to like code pushing comes into play, where Google can just like really fast um, react to whatever changes there are. And then Suhide was discontinued um, because the guy basically said like, oh, I give up, like they, they can like change their detection so fast and I, I want to do something else with my life than just like updating. Um, but then there's Magisk, um, which is um, yeah, more, a more modern way of like um, basically hiding root. Um, but Magisk is based on unlocking the bootloader and patching as a Linux policies and so on. Um, actually, this is, as far as I know, completely undetected, uh, undetectable at the moment um, due to SafeNet actually not running with full system privileges. Um, but um, yeah, in this this phase, you, yeah, you really have to like um, un unlock and modify, or like unlock your bootloader and do like heavy modifications. So it's like not probably done by a lot of users. Um, but yeah, basically, all those tools are basically. Real, real rootkits to like hide root from security services on Android, and yeah, Google is playing a nice cat and mouse game. Um, so, yeah, and also th those two um, basically just try to hide system modifications or routing, which is only one aspect of um, of Safety Net or the Safety Net Attestation API. Um, um, so I was more interested in app integrity. Um, yeah, because yeah, the other the other two the other two like checks can obviously be bypassed, and really nobody ever looked at app integrity, and I was really wondering why, and I was like, yeah, that's kind of interesting for us, so I look, was looking into app integrity, um, and basically the the the, I, the goal behind app integrity is like really to de yeah, really to detect if um, somebody modified um, your application. Um, and you do that by looking at the APK digest and the cert digest. Because if you could modify the APK, you can do something like remove like the TLS cert pinning and like modify traffic and things things like that. Um, so and you probably don't want that to happen. So that app integrity is like very interesting. Um, so well, how does how does app integrity or how does like the the cert digests actually work, or the the APK digest? The interesting part is um, there those two um, values are calculated on the AP, uh, on the APK file that is stored on disk. But if you know how Android actually works, you know like Android doesn't actually execute the APK, the, because APKs contain DEX files. And like until Android 4, DEX files would be converted to ODEX, like optimized DEX files, which is like a bytecode. In Android 4, 4 and 5 and later would just like compile the DEX code to a native code. And there was um, um, three years ago, there was like some work done on on patching um, ODEX files. Um, so this this like problem of um, calculating checksums on on our digests on one on one file, but executing another file can, um, I would say, obviously be attacked. So, if, if you like rehash the the ru code running again, so on Android four and five, you basically have the data directory, and you have under data you have app where you like APK sits, and um, then you have like the program the program data, and then you have the code on and data Dalvik cache, and then you have this like super long pass uh, file name, which is basically where like the optimized text sits. On Android 6 and later, you have um, just like your package directory, and in the package directory, you have an APK, and you have the base, o the, the base ODEX file, but in this case, it's actually not an ODEX file. Oh, it's like an ODEX file, but it just contains native code. The interesting part is those files are all owned by the system, and they can only be re read and wrote, written by actually install D and Zygote. So your own app can actually not read its own like binary. Which makes this very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, because Zygote, like, yeah, yeah. Zygote just like loads into memory and then executes, so your app doesn't really need to be able to read its own code. So um, if you go back and look at generic app modification, how, how does this actually work? Normally, you would do something like APK tool, 
then you just like unpack the file, modify the Smiley code, and use APK tool to like rebuild the APK. Then you use jar signer to like sign the file, uh, and then you can just like run the modified APK. Of course, in this case, the signature would be broken because you don't have the author's like um, keys. Um, on on the device. Um, uh, APKs are compiled using dex to out. We can just say this is dex file, this is the out file, and then you have the modified APK. Um, so what then? What you do um, with this ODEX file? Um, you you still have to like patch the ODEX, the modified ODEX file to be um, yeah, the, the ODEX file contains like a CSC32 of the dex file it was generated from. This is not a security check at all. It's just for the VM, so the VM can see us oh, that maybe the APK was updated, and now the CRC doesn't match uh, the the DEX file, and just like recompile it. That's just like a pure let's not run old code feature. It's not a security feature. And in order to patch the CRC file, I made a small tool. It's like really tiny, and that's like also open source, where you can just like patch patch the CRC um, of the ODEX file. So what you can do, basically, which will work on any Android version, uh, you can just like um, you need to override the ODEX file um, of the specific app. So if your device is rooted, you can just like go and like uh, override that specific file. And so either in the Dalvik cache or in the app in the app um, um, out cache, and then just like stop the app and restart it and um, you could just have this modified APK, and it will actually bypass all of the all of the checks because you only modified the modi uh, only modified the code that it's executed, but not the actual the or original APK. And then, of course, you have to like unroot because you want to still um, uh, uh, pass like the general device integrity checks. So, if you go back to oh, um, if you think back about earlier slides, where I said like, oh, on Android 4, you, can really, you can't really detect if a bootloader is unlocked. That basic means on Android 4, you can trivially, bu trivially bypass app integrity checks. Because, yeah, uh, if you have a root that is based on un an unlocked bootloader, you can just do that. Yeah, so that is, that is bypassed. So, but I was like, yeah, so I bet we can also find other ways to do this. So the main goal for this attack is, like as before, we really want to override this one ODEX file. Um, but we know only basically two, two, uh, two yeah, uh, demons can actually like write, or two, two binaries actually have the SLinux privileges to write to this file, or this class of files, which is install D and Zygote. But who else can write? to any file in the file system, of course, the kernel, the Linux kernel, because access privilege, access um, any, anything that's like, uh, like SL Linux or file permissions do not exist for the kernel itself. And uh, yeah, two years ago, no, one year ago, there was this like nice kernel bug um, by the name of Dirty Cow, which in, for this talk, I just like, yeah, you basically allowed you to like overwrite any file in the file system then you ca that you can read. So as um, a shell user, you can obviously read all ODEX files. So now we can go and basically, since we can read any ODEX file without rooting the device, we can actually um, do this attack without rooting a phone. So basically, the same procedure, you, the APK tool, um, the file, um, modify the, the ODEX file and patch everything. Um, but the one, the one small issue is like Dirty Cow cannot, like, can only overwrite um, files, but like basically not depend like, or increase the size of a file. And the one easy trick that I found is, um, so normally dex to out runs um, with like um, processor specific optimizations. As you can see down here, it says like Cortex A53. And optimizations usually make files much bigger. So if you just like do, if you just like compile, um, if you just run dex to out without optimizations, you will actually get a much smaller file. So even if you add like a lot of code to like the patched app, your file will still be smaller, and you can very nicely overwrite um, the ODEX file using Dirty Cow. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to show you, do a little live demo.
because it's actually that that simple. Uh, first, I'm going to show you. So, let's see. Until just have to wait a little bit until the the camera adjusts to the right. There we go. So this is like the demo app I wrote. Yep, and we pass all of the checks. And so basically, unmodif unrooted device, um, unmodified app, looks good. Uh, so, is this readable? Uh, I think that's okay. That's fine. Um, so there's this like this is the APK. So if you just like unpack this APK quickly, and then we're just like gonna modify some code. So this is just like some smiley code, which I'm going to just like patch into this application. That's all we need. So, and now we can just, um, now we just like rebuild with basically use APK tool again and like there's a sign, uh, so, um, use like the jar signer with like the default um, key store to like just have a self-signed APK. Oh, I guess, I guess I didn't set the path for that. Uh, where is that path? Who knows where that file is? It's in build tools. Mm. Uh, now I have the path for jar signer. The command arguments for jar signer. Um, yeah, that. I guess I should have. that um, oh yeah yeah it's I heard JDK is so where yeah, that's exactly where it is where is my JDK <laughs> definitely not here where is the JDK Here we go. <laughs> nope. Should be more of those. Yeah. Hmm. I was pretty sure. There we go. Okay. 
So, let's do this again. Yeah. So, now we, we resign the app. Um, so, what, what else do we need to do? So, we have our, our resigned app. Um, so, we want to compile this app on the device um, with basically we pushing like the, the the new APK and getting the modified uh, compiled ODEX. Um, now we want the original we want the original um, base file because we need to extract the original CRC. And now we can do let's say on this is the this is the original one. And this one is the one we want to change. So what, what we're going to do here is we want to change this one to this one. And now we, if we run it on this, nope. Yeah, old CRC, new CRC. Ah. Yeah, it's always nice if you forget the command line of your own applications. And now we modify. Yeah, now it's modified. So this is like patched. And for the attack, basically, we push this modified app, uh, the modified Odex file to the, to the device and then run, the, run Dirty Cow. It's another nice point of failure in this demo. And it didn't work. I can try, try again. I have a few more minutes. Yeah, li live de I like live demos. They just like turn to. Sometimes they just like do not work on the first try. Um, it's all good. So we're just going to reinstall the original APK. Since we already have all the modified files, you can just skip everything else. Okay. So let's try it one more time. And it worked. So let's go to the camera. Let's, let's wait until the, the white. So, yeah. And now you see this nice pop up we added, and you will see all those checks passing and. So, yeah, and basically, yeah, unrooted device, but complete, basically, app um, compromised from the integrity level. Um, so, what is the actual impact of this attack? Um, 
Yeah, it's of course limited to Android devices that's still vulnerable to Dirty Cow. There's probably like a lot of them. Um, the nice part is that basically the owner of the device has to like perform this attack himself because apps, so like if you get a malicious app that runs on your device, it could not modify another app because apps cannot open um, ODEX files. So that's good. Of course, the attack goes way beyond safety net um, at the station. So any any device that um, any any check you do on like like um, ODEX files or something will be vulnerable to this attack. The nice part is Android 7 devices will not be vulnerable because um, Google changed basically the policy for their CTS tests. So they will actually check if your kernel has this. Uh, still has this bug, and then you will not get Google certification for Android 7 devices. The generic attack, I told Google, like many, uh, by, uh, I guess, now it's like probably two years ago. So they know it, but it's, um, it's like, I guess, hard to fix. Copperhead OS is like hardened Android um, clone. Um, they actually, by, no, not by accident, by, by design, uh, mitigate any kind of these attacks by just recompiling every app on every start. So that would um, kill like modified ODEX files. So I made some observations over time. So basic integrity was like Jul Jul uh, July 2016. Um, suddenly I like found this, and I was like, hey, does anybody know? Because this is not really documented. And then again, in I guess May this year, they added this advice field that will tell you about like your bootloader or like please reflash your device because we d determined your device was like tempered. So that was like kind of interesting. Um, now there's also like a mailing list where you can like subscribe and they will tell you, I guess, about new features, but the website is still will not be updated like in a timely way at all. Also, the little bit more interesting part, so since um, attestation is based on CTS data and CTS is run by manufacturers um, before they um, release a, uh, a, an update or a patch or a phone. So if this um, data is false or not up to date, of course the CTS test will fail and will tell you like, hey, your device has been modified. And I actually found that uh, on like some Yota phone where like, I guess they rolled out a security patch and did not submit the CTS data. So on all of those the patch devices, actually all of this would just fail just because Google didn't have the up-to-date data. And actually Google did it themselves. Um, here in March this year, um, Google had to like pull a security update for, ne for the Nexus 7 because it like broke um, <laughs> their safety net and thereby also um, Android Pay part. And it's probably um, that the last part. I don't know like how that happened, but basically, if um, if safety net attestation has an outage and you can't react to like this outage, you will have an outage too as like an app developer, and you probably do not want that. Um, the fun part about um, yeah, um, safety net in general, um, Google really improves it like all the time. If you like follow forums, routing forums, and so, so on very closely, you will see this cat and mouse game. Um, and yeah, it's mostly for Google. I guess mostly about protecting Android Pay. Um, yeah, and yeah, um, but yeah, the, the big. The big, um, I guess, the big benefit of, of safety net on the uh, attestation part is that really you have a bunch of people at Google who constantly like work on improving basically the results for safety net. So if you use that to secure your own app, you get like a lot of security for free, where, where you otherwise would have to like employ a bunch of people or buy like a third-party product that does like app and device integrity checks for your service. The nice part is attestation is free. But of course, it can go down and have outages. They, you basically don't get an SLA. There are rate limits, which you should never be able to reach. Um, yeah, and it's free. It's like, if you compare it to like third-party services that, may, that are not free, um, this is, sh should be interesting. On a side note about malware, so there's a lot of Android malware that basically is repackaged Android apps. So basically, people just like add they're like whatever they want to do to like Angry Birds and then you will like download that modified Angry Birds. If that, if that game or like that app would actually run SafetyNet, um, they would basically have to, 
yeah, basically that repackaging wouldn't work because the app would just like say, hey, I was modified and I don't work. So they have to like either re cut out a lot of functionality of that specific app and they probably won't do that because then we'll just like go after some other app. So you can basically use this to basically prevent your product from being targeted by app repackaging malware in a, as like a side, as a side, um, um, as a side effect. So summary and conclusions, basically it's like one of the essential platform security services and if you're like see serious about like any kind of app security on Android, you should really, really use it. As I showed you, there's like a little, some uh, like downsides or some things you have to be aware of, but you have to be aware of those anyway if you, use, if you roll your own or like buy a third-party service. And the, the majority of apps will just like benefit from this and it really will really get better over time and you can really like see Google doing improvements to that. And that's it. Slides are online, tools are online on my GitHub page or like if you go to malinerorg slash Android, you'll find everything related to this talk some more references to read up. That's it. Thank you very much. And I guess we have two minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Colin. We have about three minutes for questions. So first of all, I would like to take one question from the internet, please. Oh, and just uh, to mention, people leaving or coming in, please be quiet and give us another two minutes of quiet. We do the Q&A. Why does safety net not run with full permissions? Because it runs inside the, the Google like um, Play services, like the, the um, basically the um, the, um, the Play app, like the, the Android like um, Play app service uh, app, and that only runs like as like system service, and so it doesn't run with full services because. Um, because of that, it just like runs in like a slightly privileged like app, and I think that's by design. Also, think about other manufacturers like maybe Samsung or HTC. They maybe like other companies probably like do not want to have a super high privileged Google process on their phones. Now it's just by design. Like that's the only thing I can think of. Um, yeah. Thank you. Next question from microphone number two, please. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk, first of all. Uh, it looks like safety net runs like uh, under system user, right? Yeah. And uh, it has way more privileges to check for a file system when ordinary application. Yes. Uh, do you think it is still worth to do enough uh, checks for things like root detect, like root of device and so on? I think that it really depends on like your risk model. Like if if you if you're like very concerned about modified apps or modified devices, of course it makes sense to add your own um, checks in addition. But I think if you're like starting to develop like a new app, you should first implement um, safety net attestation and get all of this right, and then you can like start investing money to to build your own because. Um, if you start rolling your own, you ha basically you have to have a team that constantly like keeps up to date with Android versions. Because if something changes in your app and your own detection has false positives, you will like just like disable your app for like a lot of people. So um, yeah, it's like uh, depending on what you want to do and like how much you want to like spend on on pe on yeah on that. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is up by now, so whoever else has questions, please find Colin after the talk. Um, I know, I pro you probably all know that it's pretty nerve-wracking when you're on stage and your demo or whatever you were planning in your presentation doesn't work as planned. So I hope that you're going to show a lot of empathy and give Colin another big round of applause. Thank you very much.